I'm going to have Amanda. She's going to come sing a special song called Why. to town the other day just me and my daddy he said I'd finally reach that age that I could ride next to him on a horse that of course was not quite as wide we heard a crowd of people shouting and so we stopped to find out why and there was that man that my dad said he loved but today there was fear in his eyes so i said daddy why are they screaming why are the faces of some of them beaming why is he dressed in that bright purple robe i'll bet that crown hurts him more than it shows daddy please can't you do something he looks as though he's gonna cry you said he was stronger than all of those guys daddy please tell me why why does everyone want him to die Later that day, the sky grew cloudy And Daddy said I should go inside Somehow he knew things would get stormy Boy, was he right But I could not keep from wondering If there was something he had to hide so after he left, I had to find out I was not afraid of getting lost So I followed the crowds To a hill where I knew man had been killed And I heard a voice come from the cross and it said, Father, why are they screaming? Why are the faces of some of them beaming? Why are they casting their lots for my robe? This crown of thorns hurts me more than it shows. Father, please, can't you do something? I know that you must hear my cry. I thought I could handle a cross of this size. Father, remind me why. Why does everyone want me to die? Oh, and will I understand why? My precious son, I hear them screaming. I'm watching the face of the enemy beaming. But soon I will clothe you in robes of my own. Jesus, this hurts me much more than you know. But this dark hour, I must do nothing. Though I've heard your unbearable cry. The power of your 
your blood destroys all of the lies. Soon you'll see past their unmerciful lies. Look there below, see the child trembling by her father's side. Now I can tell you why. She is why you must die. Please stand as you are able for the reading of God's Word. This reading is from John 20, verses 1 through 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon, Simon Peter, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. That song is just so moving, and it asks one of the most critical questions, why? Right? The, the why question in life is so impactful. If you will allow that to get into who you are as a person, just start thinking about, like, why am I here? Why does God have me in this time and this place? Why was I born where I've been born? Why during this, this part of history... Why this story? Why the resurrection? Ask these questions of yourselves. Because I think this is exactly what the disciples were wrestling with. And I want to pick, off, pick up with John 20, verse 9. And it says, they still, meaning the disciples, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, I, want, I always like to put us back into Scripture and think about what it would be like if you were there during that time. Here were the disciples. These were the people who had been given up on. They didn't have a rabbi. You know, the best of the best, they would study under a rabbi, but that these guys, they were just kind of like the leftovers, the losers, the outcasts. And so they went back to their family businesses. And then one day Jesus showed up and said, come and follow me. And they left everything behind to go and follow this guy named Jesus. And why they followed him is because he was proclaiming to be a Messiah. Some of you may not know, there was many Messiahs that had come and gone. So here they are, and they're backing this guy named Jesus. And they're saying, we're taking a risk, and we're going to follow him. There's something different about him. We see a lot of the miracles that he's doing. It's like, wow, that's getting their attention. Maybe this is the one. Maybe this Jesus is truly the Messiah, and we're backing the right guy. And then all of a sudden, here comes Friday, and he's being crucified. He's being beaten, and he's hanging on a cross. And we know the story that 
They all left him. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. And then all of a sudden, think about all the fears, all the confusion, and all the anger. We just wasted three years of our lives. And we backed the wrong guy. Here we go again. Back to fishing, back to doing this and that. So I want to make it real for you today. Think about if you were a person and you were madly in love with the one. You're dating this, I'm going to say it for me. You're dating this young lady and you're like just madly in love with her. And then one day she comes and says, I'm done. I'm out. I want nothing to do with you. Some of us, that's a real story. Now think about the angst. Think about you're going back in time and you're thinking about the years that you spent with this person. You're thinking about the commitment. You're, you're saying, I thought I left it all on the line for this person. And I put my heart out there just to get squashed. What do you do if two days later, as you're caught in all those emotions, and you're caught, I'll never do that again. I'm never going to back a Savior again. And she comes back and says, I'm back. I want to restore our relationship. How do you handle that? And so this idea of what's happening in the disciples' lives is they're, they're on a roller coaster ride. Their Savior who they backed is now dead. And then Saturday, they're wrestling with that. And then all comes, here comes Sunday, and this message comes out that, wait a second, the tomb is empty. What are you talking about? The tomb is empty. And now they have to wrestle with, is it real? Is resurrection really true? Is what Jesus was telling us when we had no idea what he was talking about? Some lunatic. What, you're going to be raised three days later? And now he's back. And the scriptures go on. There's like 400 witnesses that saw him. And story after story, and they're touching him and saying, is it really you? And I would suggest today that we are in the same place where we have to wrestle with this message. And I named it Resurrection. What if it's true? And some of you know me very well, so I don't like to do this by myself, so I've engaged others. And I just, I was so curious about what other people thought about this. I started, I started sending texts out to my friends. I said, hey, tell me what you think about these questions. So I've asked, I've captured some of those thoughts. Who did I give the things to? David, you're going to be last. All right, we'll start with you right here. Yeah, there's, yeah you'll, you'll last. That will help. And who else has a reading, just so I know where I'm running to? Over there and over there. Okay, go ahead. So these are the answers when I ask this question to different folks. We are part of the greatest story, the greatest adventure ever told, ever imagined for all time. We are eternal by the power of the Holy Spirit, designed to be in union with a being perfect in love perfect in wisdom and joy. We are his bride. He has pursued us from creation through death into eternity. Our broken world will be renewed. The grandeur of the earth, its canyons and peaks, wind and colorful sunsets will be remade more beautiful than we have ever seen. The great forests of the redwoods, the phantasmic creatures long extinct, the biodiversity all reborn. Color itself will be rich and the air and water pure. We will sing at the top of our lungs like children do, like my son did when I told him we are going to Mega Park today. Look <laughs> it up. Our adventure is just beginning. He has so much more for us beyond this broken realm. Like Star Trek? <laughs> Thank you. Where did I go over here? No, no, you're not. <laughs> I think resurrection permeates everything. Like gravity. What does it mean if it's true, not true? I don't really think in those terms. It's just the water we swim in. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It still impacts you. The seasons that regenerate the earth are bodies that shed cells and replace them by the millions every day. Even relationships that die and are later reborn, usually through a process of forgiveness and time. 
All these things are real and experienced by all of us, regardless of whether we acknowledge Christ as the source of them or not. Just be reflecting. Hope tempts all of us. It calls to us in the stories we enjoy, the music we sing, any art form we create. Not many of us can remain permanently hopeless. No matter how deep the despair, we get up in the morning, and in some way, shape, or form, we try again. Belief, doubt, hope, despair, I see it as just part of the journey for, for us all. The fact that hope inspires us, that we are continually drawn into the possibility of something better, is part of the power of resurrection, whether you believe in it or not. If resurrection is true, then life is the biggest and best gift ever given. Grace covers all for all. Thank you. Just hold on to that. I love what people had to write and to share. It's so rich. It's true. And I'm not going to focus too much on this, but what if it's not true? And the scriptures actually address this. And, and Paul, he's the apostle Paul. He wrote most of the, the New Testament. He says, if we only have hope in Christ for now, then we ought to be pitied more than all men. And I was thinking about, why would he say that? And I was thinking about that there's no hope. What if there is just no hope in that this is all there was? our 70, 80, 90 years on this earth. And, and I started thinking to myself, it's like a lot of people have gone after the things like when there's that void and you go, this is all I have. What do we do? We start to chase that which we think would give us meaning. So we've all seen people, maybe it's our own experience. We go after the women and we just go after sex and more sex and more sex. And then we wake up one day and wake up all alone. Hey man, it wasn't worth it, was it? What about having a committed relationship in marriage? One of the most beautiful things that represents, I think, the closest we'll ever get to a relationship with God here on earth is that committed sacrificial love of our spouse. Or maybe we chase after drugs and alcohol, and the next high. And what does it do? It leaves us empty to chase after the next high and the next high. And we're never satisfied. It's never enough. It's like a chasing after the wind, the Bible says. And then some of us, we have this idea of more, more things. Materialism, right? If I can just make enough money and I can buy a, enough things, maybe I'll be happy. Maybe I'll be satisfied. And if any of us have lost loved ones who are later in life, that that was their story on their deathbed. I've never heard anyone wish that they had more things. I only hear regrets. As I wish I would have spent more time with the people that I love the most. So we're going to have a drama and then music, and then I'll come up with a couple of more thoughts on this about what if it's true, because I think it's the great adventure. So with that, Stephanie and Matt are going to do a drama. Immediately before breathing his last breath, Jesus loudly cried out one final word on the cross, to Tetelestai. One word with a critical meaning. It is finished. It is completed, brought to an end, accomplished with finality. After Satan had shamed, beaten, mocked, tortured, and crucified the Son of God. As the devil celebrated because he had done his worst. Jesus didn't just whisper a meager resolution, I am finished. Exhausted, giving up, surrendering to death and the enemy. Oh no, he declared for all eternity, it is finished. The law was made perfect. Jesus had obeyed his Father's will. It is 
finished. God's righteous wrath collided with God's perfect grace and love. Justice had been satisfied. Reconciliation between flawed humanity and a holy God was made possible. It is finished. The Son allowed people to see a glimpse of the Father. He brought light to the nations. It is finished. <sighs> the messianic prophecies had been fulfilled. The veil was torn. The Old Testament sacrificial system was now obsolete. Jesus became the blameless sacrifice for every sin. Once and for all, the debt was paid in full. Now and for always, it is finished. There's nothing more for you or me to add. Your good works are insufficient to appease a holy God. Turning over a new leaf gets you nothing eternal. Your striving for perfection will never be able to improve on what Jesus has already done. It is finished. Your, pro your poverty nor your prosperity will earn you reconciliation with God. You cannot give enough, acquire enough, or even deprive yourself enough to profit God's favor. And you'll never be able to attend enough religious gatherings to add anything to his completed work on the cross. Your performance, talent, intellect, all are deficient for salvation. It is finished. There is no extra special word or understanding required. You don't need a new revelation from a preacher, a prophet, a teacher, a book, blog, friend, even yourself. It is finished. Anything you try to add to his completed work in order to be made right with God is impotent. Perhaps even insulting. And actually heretical. It is finished. So what does one do when the work of salvation is complete? Believe and repent. Rest. Worship and give thanks. Rejoice and share. Believe that Jesus is Lord and he has fully paid the debt of your salvation. Repent from your belief in your own self-sufficiency and follow Jesus exclusively. It is finished. Worship, rest, quit striving for God's love, acceptance, and forgiveness. The work is done. Accept it. Rest in it. Live every day in the good news of the gospel. Worship and give thanks. Give God the glory he is due. Express gratitude for his mercy and his grace. It is finished. Rejoice and share. Doesn't everyone need to know about this freedom? Praise, Praise Jesus. Jesus. It, it is, is finished. finished. Amen. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, 
my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Thank you so much. I love bringing in the arts. You all did a fantastic job. I want to pick up in the last book of the, of the scriptures, Revelation 21, 3 through 5, it says, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, no more us than them. And God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. Here's the good news. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That is the Christian hope. Whether you believe it or not, that's the journey. And I welcome you to just continue to ask questions. Continue to go on this journey. But try it on. Because what if it's true? The resurrection. This idea of the Christian hope is that Jesus died on the cross. Well, think about it this way. If Jesus just died on the cross, we believe he took it upon himself, suffering, death, sin, and evil. But if Jesus stayed dead, it's simply a powerful and beautiful message. And it's a wonderful example to live by how he lived his life. But this one life on earth is all we have. So the Christian worldview is offering a different end to the story. Where there is no more suffering. And I just want you to hold on to that for a moment. Because all of us, whether it's ourselves right now that are in a place of suffering, 
or if you've lost a loved one, or if you've gone through something, and you know the pain of suffering, what would it be like when all things have been made new and there's no more suffering? There's no more loss. There's no more pain. What would it be like if all of our relationships were restored wholly, completely, perfectly? What if there was no more evil in the world? Can you even comprehend the message? Every day we're inundated by the messages of mass media, and we see every day evil rearing its ugly head. What if there was peace in all the world? Because this Christian worldview, if it were true, there would be no more evil. There'd be no more sickness. I know there's a lot of people in this room that have been battling cancer. Or what other, other illnesses there are? And you go down that path and that journey, there will be no more sickness. Our bodies will be complete and whole. And then this beautiful message of there will be no more death. That we get to live forever and ever in this new heaven, in this new earth, this new creation, it says in Revelation. What would that be like in all its fullness? These are the questions to wrestle with. Now you might be wondering, if this is true and Jesus died and then he was resurrected, why, why wasn't it just done that way? Well, the promise is that it's been fulfilled, but it yet hasn't been realized. So it was complete on that day when Jesus went to the cross and died and then the third day when he was raised to life, which we're celebrating here today. It was completely fulfilled, but not yet realized because he said that he would come back again. And that's our Christian hope that one day Jesus will return and make all things new. So what do we do in between? And this is the great adventure that I'm talking about. This idea that we get to help usher in new creation. This idea of suffering and evil and sickness and death. That we now get to enter into the pain of others. We get to restore broken relationships and make things new. And every single day when we wake up, there's an opportunity to team up with God and to do something to bring good news into the world. And that's worth waking up to. And that's why we're here. And our hope is that one day, God will come back in the form of Jesus Christ and make all things new. And that's why we're here this morning. Because He is risen. We have a job to do. I just want you to capture this sentence. One of our, our vision or our mission statement is simply to bring the good news wherever we go. Bring life into dying situations. Bring hope into places of despair. Be the light in the darkness. Be comfort amidst the suffering. And here's the sentence. The great adventure is living a life that brings good news to others with the hope that we are ushering in new creation. That is our hope. And with that, we're going to close with a song called Forever. <laughs> he is risen. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to come here and to celebrate the risen Christ. We love you so much. We're energized by what you've called us to do, to go out and make a difference in the world by loving the other and humbly humbling ourselves, to look at others and just think more highly of them and put their interests first and to care deeply and to love more so. Father God, just continue to do a work inside of us and to help us to restore broken relationships, to bring hope 
and dignity and respect to all people. Father God, we love you and we thank you for what you've done for rising up Christ and helping us to live a life of resurrection ourselves, to bring hope into despair and to be the light in the darkness. We love you and we praise you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming to church. Have a happy Passover and a happy Easter. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Have a great day.